Hello to all and off we go for the start of the year with a new episode in our who's who of watchmaking series and we'll do so with one of the biggest names in watchmaking history, Breguet. And not only talk about Abraham Louis Breguet, the acknowledged genius, because there is a real and interesting legacy behind this name. So first of all, and to clarify something very rapidly, Breguet was indeed born in Neuchâtel in 1747, but at the time the canton de Neuchâtel wasn't even part of Switzerland as we know it today, and, in, and his history is mainly linked with France as we will uncover now. So today, if you get a group of watch connoisseurs together for dinner or for, or for a few drinks, well, at some point in the conversation, the question will be asked, well, what do you think Breguet would be doing if he was still alive today? Cue debates about whether he would be working for one of the major houses or would he be a lone independent in the same veins as uh, uh, François-Paul Jouan or Kari Voutilainen. The other answer is that he wouldn't be working in watches at all, because if you cast your eyes back over Abraham Louis Breguet's career, well, you'll see that he is first and foremost an inventor, that he chose horology as the medium through which his inventiveness could flourish and could be seen in a certain way as merely chance. Take away the watches and it could be argued that Breguet would be in fact some kind of Steve Jobs, Elon Musk style figure if he were alive today. An inventor creating things that make subtle yet seismic differences to the way the world around them works. It was Breguet's stepfather, Joseph Tate, who introduced the young boy to watches in the early 1760s when he was 11 or 12. Though apparently at the time he showed little interest in Tate's workshop. It wasn't until he was 15 in uh, 1762 that he decided watchmaking might be something he could explore, but it took being uh, apprenticed to a Versailles-based master watchmaker for Breguet's talent to come to the fore. Being in Paris and having the likes of precision clock and marine chronometer maker Ferdinand Bertou, a name we will shortly come back onto in another video, surprise surprise, but also famed movement maker Jean-Antoine Lépine around, influenced the young Breguet and in 1775 he finally set up his own watchmaking company on the Quai de l'Horloge near Notre Dame. And it was from this address that most of the most incredible inventions in watchmaking were created. First up in 1780 was the Perpetuel, the world's first self-winding watch that actually worked. It was this watch that uh, drew the attention of Queen Marie Antoinette as she bought one of the first produced and led to one of the most famous commissions the Breguet name has ever produced. In 1783, an admirer of the Queen ordered a watch that was to be as spectacular as possible. It was to be rendered in gold with every complication available at the time and due to a lack of time or financial limits, neither Abraham Louis nor Marie Antoinette saw the finished watch as it was completed four years after his death and 34 years after hers. And this timepiece is referred to as the Marie Antoinette. However, Breguet is a lifetime short of achievements, ranging from uh, tact watches where you actually feel the time on the dial side, and he also invented the Sympathique, a table clock that could automatically wind and set the pocket watch that accompanied it. There was uh, the automatic winding device with the central uh, rotor, the parachute, which is the shock absorber for the balance wheel, the ultra flat movement complete with several complications, the circular gong and the Breguet overcoil, I mean that's the upraising of the balance spring's last coil, which reduced its curvature and improved the watch's precision. So very recently we saw some kind of tribute to this coming from Ulrich, but this time the mother clock being atomically regulated, so just a tad more precise. But the idea is indeed a more than a 200 year old one, a time where no computer exists or CNC machines, so it's quite respectful I would say. Okay, let's go back to Breguet himself and naturally what he is the most famous for, the tourbillon, meaning the rotating uh, cage mountain escapement and balance wheel that counteracts the effect of gravity when the wearer's pocket watch is kept in a single position for any period of time. So despite now being uh, kind of useless in the world of wristwatches, it continues to be a signifier of a brand's technical skill. But at the time, people had pocket watches mainly standing in a vertical position in your vest I mean, or proper clock, which by definition are standing vertically. But Breguet didn't just invent things, he had a design language that lasted too. There are the blue hands with the moon tips and the slightly ornate uh, Arabic numerals, which have been prefaced with Abraham Louis' name, and that remain a signature of the brand as well as being appropriated by others as well. 
During Breguet's lifetime, the number of watches produced varies from different sources, but we are nevertheless talking uh, thousands of watches, meaning that he naturally had a rather large team of workers and contractors working for him. And most of his watches were made for emperors, kings, queens and nobility. In terms of cornering the rich and well-positioned market, well, he definitely stole a march on Patek, which came slightly later. After his death in 1823, Abraham Louis' son, Louis Antoine, inherited the business and 10 years later he handed it over to his son, Louis François Clément, and his grandson, Antoine. Although they continued to make watches in the Breguet spirit of being at the forefront of advancements, uh, Louis and Antoine were more interested in telephones. When engineer and scientist Alexander Graham Bell came to France, he became friends with both Antoine and Louis, a friendship uh, which led to the Breguets obtaining four licenses from Bell to produce telephones in France. And as a pretty little funny story, the Quai de l'Horloge address in Paris became the first premises in France to have a telephone so employees could communicate between the workshop and the laboratory. And uh, when the business was sold in 1870 to an English watchmaker called Edward Brown, who had been a uh, watchmaker in chief at Breguet, the family moved into electronics, if one can refer this as electronics when we're talking late 19th century. But watches continue to be made under the Breguet name uh, by the Brown family for the next hundred years. But this name uh, that was once so linked with horology was now part of another brave new world, aviation. Louis-Charles Breguet, Abraham Louis' great-great-grandson, brought his uh, inherited spirit of innovation to developing aircraft. He worked on the forerunner of the helicopter, uh, the gyroplane, and built and uh, quickly crashed a fixed-wing aircraft in 1909. But he is most well known for the development of uh, reconnaissance aircraft used by the French uh, military in World War I and throughout the 1920s. Named the Breguet 14, Le Breguet 14, it was a single-engine bomber and one of the most uh, widely used French warplanes of its time, with aviation instruments made by the Brown-owned Breguet Watch Company, who also supplied then military watches such as the Type 20 uh, to the French Air Force. It wasn't until the 1970s that the seeds of the modern-day incarnation of Breguet can be seen, when the brand was acquired by the Chaumet brothers. Relatively unknown, uh, Daniel Roth uh, was brought on board to design the watches and he made the decision to return, to, to return the focus to aesthetics, uh, palm hands and guilloche dials and naturally complication. So despite a successful first Basel World in 1983, by 1987 things weren't looking good for the brand due to the Chaumet brothers' arrest for defrauding their customers and bankers. Yes, another nice little story. So with 300 million uh, in, uh, dollars in liabilities, they filed for bankruptcy and desperate not to see the entire French jewelry and watch industry tarred by the Chaumet's indiscretions, well then Prime Minister Jacques Chirac also got involved in the hunt for another buyer. So now enter Investcorp uh, and the start of a kind of a 12 less than vintage years for Breguet. So Roth left and despite Investcorp also buying Nouvelle Lemania and Micromechanics supply of Valdar in 1991, everything that made Breguet great disappeared. The first problem uh, was that Investcorp tried to position Breguet as a sports brand, uh, which had nothing to do with, it, with its heritage. But there were other problems. Nouvelle Lemania supplied Breguet with its haute horlogerie movement, but it was also allowed to continue working with other brands such as Omega. That meant that these uh, supposedly high complication movements could be bought by the customer in cheaper guises, immediately lowering any prestige that Breguet had. And in an even more confused strategy, Breguet was also taking, taking in complications from Gégère Lecoultre and Frédéric Piguet. So the 90s incarnation of this once legendary French name was in a sad state. It had uh, no exclusive calibers, no manufacturer status, and a, lot of it, uh, and a lot of its movements were showcased better and cheaper in other brands. So the only decent watch made during the period was the Type 20, though given that it was uh, in stainless steel and not as expensive as many of the collection, this military-inspired watch was seen to be a further cheapening of the Breguet name. By September 1999, Investcorp had had enough and wanted to get rid of its watch investment. Ebel and Chaumet, also part of Investcorp, uh, were bought by LVMH and the Swatch Group acquired Breguet and Nouvelle Le Mania for a rumored 250 million uh, Swiss franc. Even then, it was the Nouvelle Le Mania that was the draw as the group didn't want to lose its Speedmaster supplier.
So, however, Nicolas Hayek Sr. saw potential in Breguet. He resigned as CEO and president of the Swatch Group and uh, devoted all his attention to his new acquisition. It was a bold move, but one that took the name back to its root. It was uh, no longer a brand, but the singular vision of one man, a very passionate man. So, the first thing Hayek Sr. did was uh, roll Nouvelle uh, Lemania into Breguet immediately giving it back its in-house status and allowing him to create Manufacture Breguet. By 2009, with the exception of spirals supplied by Nibarox, cases and uh, some rare movements that were still entrusted to Frédéric Piguet, everything else was made in-house. Hayek Sr. also stopped the, the sale of all Lemania movements to anyone outside the SWAT group and went about removing all Abraham Louis Breguet and Breguet and Feast watches uh, from the second-hand market to, the, to make them the exclusive property of the new Montre Breguet Museum. The watches themselves were also given a serious overhaul, with the Tradition collection being instated as the pinnacle of the brand's output. They were inspired by Abraham Louis' uh, subscription uh, watches, uh, timepieces customers could reserve with a down payment, which originally contained Breguet's original parachute uh, balance system shock-protecting device. Women's watches also became a focus, drawing on the original Breguet's popularity with the female royalty. The Reine de Naples pieces were exquisite jewelry watches that took their design cues from a timepiece Breguet created for Napoleon Bonaparte's sister, the Queen of Naples. With its unusual elliptic uh, case and combination of horological clout with the haute joaillerie technique, it was a brave uh, launch for the brand, but one that really paid off. By 2017, this collection accounted for 35% of Breguet's sales. In another move to uh, leverage Breguet's extraordinary history of innovation, in 2008, it recreated the famous uh, Marie Antoinette pocket watch, complete with jumping hour, perpetual calendar, minute repeater, thermometer, and equation of time. It was an incredible feat of watchmaking, something that uh, was compounded when in November of that same year the original timepiece was recovered after it was stolen in the priceless uh, clock collection heist from the LA Mayer Museum for Islamic Art in Jerusalem in 1983. Although history has provided a guide for this uh, iteration of Breguet, it does continue to innovate. It has uh, spearheaded the use of silicon becoming, uh, back in 2005, with its Caliber 591A, the first brand to have a movement featuring the escape wheel, lever and balance spring in this material. Eau de Breguet Classic Chronometry 27 and its very original balance wheel where its pivot is standing mechanically on one side but held by magnetism on the other, while in 2017 its Marine Equation Marchand Reference 5887 featured a peanut-shaped equation of time cam which was grown onto a sapphire disc using electroplating to improve accuracy. So the near brilliance of Breguet's original innovation may never be truly matched by the modern incarnation of the brand, but then, as I think we can all agree, the original Abraham Louis Breguet wouldn't be making groundbreaking horological invention in the 21st century either. He would be in the Silicon Valley instead. Okay, so this is it for this Who's Who of Watchmaking episode. Can't wait to continue with this series. I hope you enjoyed it and VIVA WATCHMAKING!